Your Eminences, ladies and gentlemen, I will start with my uh, I will start my talk uh, on uh, well the title is a kind of awkward because it is about uh, the status of the proposed constitution uh, so I can step down easily because there is no such proposed constitution but rather I would like to I mean instead of stepping down uh, I'll start torturing you for about 20 or 25 minutes on what this means for the future of religious freedom in Turkey. Uh, and in order to answer this question, I think we should address actually a more basic question. Uh, what in fact does the current constitution have uh, kind of impact or uh, negative or positive influence on the furthering or uh, advancement of religious freedom in Turkey. So th maybe I can reformulate this question. Do we really need a new constitution in order to have more freedom, more space for freedom of religion uh, in the Turkish context? Uh, my answer will be in the end, yes, but with some uh, reservations. There are still many things we can do within the existing framework of the, the Constitution and the legal norms in the Turkish state. Let me first remind you of the uh, issues first that we face. If we look at this, the web page of this conference, uh, there are several issues of concern for the uh, ecumenical uh, patriarchate. Uh, these are listed as government interference in patriarchal elections, non-recognition of ecumenical status, no legal identity, closing of seminary and inability to train clergy, and confiscation of property. These are issues of concern, particularly of the ecumenical patriarchate. But when we look at these issues in a more general way, these are actually issues of uh, non-Muslim minorities in general. Armenians, uh, Jews, or other uh, uh, Christian communities, uh, but also uh, the Alevi community suffers from these, some of these issues, because all of these issues actually uh, point out to the fact that Turkey has been, uh, since 1920s, since the inception of the Republic, Turkey has been violating and still continues to violate core components of what we would call the normative core of religious freedom. Uh, there's an important uh, seminal work on uh, religious freedom uh, in the world. Uh, one of the editors are, is with us, Professor Durham. Uh, they uh, produced a seminal volume entitled Facilitating Freedom of Religion or Belief, uh, that is a desk book, uh, and it is on my desk always. Uh, and uh, in the introduction, they identify eight uh, components of the normative core of religious freedom. Let me just uh, cite by, just uh, read them. Internal freedom, external freedom, non-coercion, non-discrimination, rights of parents and guardians, which has very good implications on the education, corporate freedom or legal status, what we discuss, legal personality, permissible restrictions on external freedom, uh, and non-derogability. And when we look at the issues that we have to address within the framework of this conference, we can, uh, I mean, definitely say that Turkey has been violating all these core components of the normative uh, structure of what we understand by uh, freedom of religion. Why is this so? <clears throat> this, all these violations, I think, can be connected to a political decision Turkey has made back in 1920s, before the inception of the Republic in 1923, when what, they, what we call the national struggle, Milli Mujadele, was taking place, uh, and 
when the uh, Grand National Assembly first convened in uh, 1920, April 23rd, uh, in Ankara. They were discussing uh, in, in that uh, assembly, uh, one of the crucial discussions was on the definition of the identity of the people. And uh, influenced by the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 in uh, Russia, uh, there was this definition of the pupil as uh, the laborers, uh, either in the countryside, the peasants, or the uh, factory workers, uh, who are very little uh, at that time. Uh, but there were also some uh, questions whether doctors, shopkeepers, uh, carpenters, etc., uh, will be included in the definition of the pupil. And uh, after a series of debates, the answer was yes, those. Uh, shopkeepers and uh, tradesmen, artisans, etc. They are also uh, included in the pupil. Another question raised by one of the deputies at that time, whether non-Muslims will be included in the pupil as we define it uh, in the assembly, and uh, the assembly's answer was no. So the exclusion of non-Muslim minorities dates back to the uh, formative years of the republic. So this is a political decision made by the founding uh, assembly of the uh, republic. Actually, republic was, uh, incept ince inception of the republic was done by uh, a subsequent uh, assembly, but it's uh, similar in terms of their mentalities. This definition of uh, nation uh, is political. I refer to the German uh, constitutional theorist Carl Schmitt of the 1920s, of the Weimar period, when he means by political definition of the nation, he means uh, a political decision that uh, defines the uh, identity of the community as the nation uh, on the basis of uh, friends of the nation and foes of the nation as well. So. I think the definition of Turkish people or Turkish nation, these are words that were then in the 1920s used interchangeably. Uh, this definition of the Turkish nationhood uh, was uh, fits specifically to this Schmittian notion of the political decision. So it is still with us. So unless we change this definition, uh, we are in the uh, within the frames or confines of uh, this uh, nationhood. Uh, so this uh, definition of nationhood uh, created some important problems. One problem, uh, not uh, directly relating to the uh, notion of religious freedom, is uh, something like this. It, it paved the way for two different uh, nationalist ideologies. The definition of the Turkish nation as in a way to exclude non-Muslims on Anatolia uh, necessitated, necessitated the definition of the nationhood on uh, Islamic terms. So this was uh, in line with the Ottoman uh, practice, so it has a constitutional historical continuity. Uh, nation in the Ottoman sense, millet, as you all know, in the millet system, has uh, refers particularly to uh, religious community. Here, in the uh, context of the 1920s, uh, milli mujadele meant Islamic struggle, struggle for the independence of the caliphate and uh, sultanate from uh, foreign invasion, etc. But when Mustafa Kemal and his followers uh, took over uh, the political power after 1923, the definition of this nation, uh, they wanted to secularize this definition. So we ended up in 1924 with two competing definition of Turkish nationhood. Uh, one is uh, the traditional Islamic understanding of nationalism, and the other one is modern, uh, secular and uh, Kemalist, let's say, uh, understanding of uh, Turkish nation. 
after the uh, population exchange in 1924, the Islamization of the Anatolian population, which started in, uh, after the Armenian genocide, uh, has been almost complete. Now, in today's uh, present-day Turkey, we uh, see politicians uh, talking in a very proud way uh, that 99% of the uh, Turkish population or Turkish society are Muslims, uh, but without any uh, effort to come to terms with how this happened. Because as we all know, before 1915, before the Armenian genocide, uh, almost 30 to 35% of the Anatolian population were non-Muslims. So this is something that we have to uh, come to terms with uh, and get uh, ourselves, uh, pull ourselves together in. Uh, Turkish society to uh, account for uh, in a very critical manner how this happened. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this uh, difference between two forms of nationalism uh, shaped Turkish politics in a way that uh, either the Kemalist one or uh, the traditional conservative one, both nationalisms wanted to base their power or legitimize their power on ideological grounds. One may be more secular, but the other one may be more Islamic. But this is the thing that we continuously come across when we think about freedom, extension of pluralism, state neutrality, the topics we are discussing. So, The 1982 Constitution is a culmination of this process of uh, shaping Turkish society along uh, nationalist lines. And in the 1982 Constitution, the drafters, the authors of this Constitution, not only the military, it is always uh, emphasized that 1982 is the product of a military regime in 1980, but it is written by civilians, by law professors, and uh, I have to tell you uh, that uh, some uh, well-established professors of theology in Ankara have a bearing impact, they have their stamp on this uh, constitution. So the 1982 constitution was an attempt at constitutionalizing, in a way legalizing, what was in the 1970s called the ideology of Turkish Islamic synthesis, bringing together diverse forms of nationalism in, in a way to reunite Turkish society uh, as a nation, both Turk and Muslim, with the exclusion of non-Muslims. Uh, this is a continuation, obviously, dating back to uh, 1920s or maybe dating back to uh, Armenian genocide, as I said. Uh, but also with the exclusion of the Kurds, uh, with the exclusion, with the historical continuing exclusion of the Alawi community, and with other communities that might fall outside of the state control. So this constitution, uh, with a strong nationalist uh, understanding or foundation, uh, as defined by uh, what I said, Turco-Islamic uh, synthesis, has certain articles, paragraphs, which were so designed to uh, entrench these uh, ideological the tenets of these, uh, this ideology. For example, the preamble. The preamble reads something like this, word by word, affirming the external, this is the official translation in the Turkish Grand National Assembly webpage, affirming the external existence of the Turkish motherland and nation, and this is more important, I think, the indivisible unity of the sub sublime Turkish state. This constitution, it continues. Now, from 
that viewed from this perspective, this preamble says the Constitution determines the sublime existence and identity of the state. And as far as I know, I mean, to my humble knowledge, there is no such beginning or preamble in any modern democratic constitution. This is unique. Uh, no constitution determines the state. Constitutions are for protecting human rights uh, against the violations coming from the part of the state. So, uh, in fact, we have a constitution, but it is no constitution. So this is the paradox. But uh, I think one of our speakers before the panel, Özgür, was it you? Uh, she mentioned that the preamble is uh, not legally uh, significant, uh, but this is not true. Uh, if I'm mistaken, she may correct me later or even hit me. Uh, <laughs> but I think she, she said that. The preamble is part of the constitutional text and it is legally binding. It is binding in a sense that uh, Article 2 refers to the preamble uh, when it defines the genuine characteristics of the Turkish Republic, uh, saying Turkish Republic is a democratic uh, rule of law state, uh, respectful to human rights, etc. But it also refers to uh, some alignment to the ideology of Ataturk's nationalism and other principles as they were mentioned in the preamble. So preamble is binding, it is part of the constitution, and when you take the wording of the Article 4 seriously, you cannot even change the preamble because Article 2 is an un unamendable. Uh, but the preamble has been changed back in 1995. Uh, that's also another fact. Uh, Article 24, Article 42, uh, these are the uh, crucial articles for our thinking of the state of the uh, state of affairs pertaining to religious freedom in the Turkish constitution. And these are connected to uh, the preamble and the main idea of this Turkish nationalism that uh, somewhat forms the foundational basis of the Turkish state. Compulsory courses of religious uh, culture and ethics. This is kind of a nut term. Uh, the, the syllabus as the European Committee Against Racism and Intolerance has repeated in many reports back in 2000 and 2005, uh, the syllabus uh, somewhat includes uh, several religions and faiths uh, to be uh, taught to Turkish students in primary and secondary schools. But in fact, this is a uh, religious education course which, uh, whose curricula uh, is uh, determined by the uh, Directorate of Religious Affairs uh, in Ankara. So it is a kind of Sunni Muslim indoctrination of Turkish youth uh, exemption is allowed for non-Muslim children, children of non-Muslim minorities, that's a good thing, but uh, Alevis are forced to take these courses, even uh, Kurds who have Shafi faith, uh, who don't agree with the Hanafi uh, interpretation of the Diyanet, uh, of the Islamic religion, they are also forced to uh, enter these courses, and it has been uh, established uh, violation of uh, human rights, uh, freedom of, uh, no, the right to education by the European Court in Strasbourg. Arti Article 42 is a ban on uh, education in motherland, uh, uh, mother language. Uh, this is also, I think, in a way related to uh, what we think uh, the core elements of uh, religious freedom because language is also very important uh, in, uh, for uh, religious freedom. Uh, when we think of all these things, we, uh, we also have another uh, article in uh, the Constitution. It is Article 136 on the Diyanet. Uh, whether Diyanet is going to, is, should be in the Constitution, whether it should have a constitutional status, this is debated uh, in the current uh, situation, but it has a history. Uh, 
Back in 1924, uh, Dianet uh, was the Directorate of Religious Affairs was established after the uh, abolishment of the office of the Sheikh al-Islam. Uh, so Dianet is inception, Dianet's inception uh, is kind of replacement of the office of Sheikh al-Islam. But Sheikh al-Islam had four uh, areas of power, uh, worship, uh, faith, uh, and uh, morals. And on top of that, uh, Sheikh al-Islam also had some kind of legislative authority uh, in the Ottoman context. Now the legislative authority in the 1920s is now in the monopoly of the Turkish Grand National Assembly. The remaining three areas of control of issue, uh, worship, faith, and morals, they are, uh, they are given to the control of uh, the Anet. So uh, it was the republic's, uh, early republic's uh, ambition to control and shape the uh, worship, faith, and morals of Turkish society, I mean the Muslims now, since non-Muslims are uh, out of discussion, uh, the Muslims sh will be shaped by the Anet. Uh, this is given, this institution is given constitutional status in 1961 constitution, and it was only one uh, simple clause. But in 1982 constitution, the clause that defines Diyanet as a constitutional institution, states that Diyanet works with the aim of maintaining or creating, maintaining or sustaining uh, national integrity or integration and solidarity. So Turkish nation, its integrity, its unity, its uh, solidarity, etc. Uh, is thought to be established by a central state organization, which uh, Doan Bermek uh, yesterday told us that enjoys some five million Turkish lira budget. But another uh, aspect of this, Dianet is uh, an institutional organ within the state administration, the central administration. So it doesn't have a legal personality on its own. So this explains how Turkish state approaches the issue of the legal personality of religious communities, be it non-Muslims, Alawis, or other Sunni brotherhoods, tariqats, or communities, or even the Hanafi uh, majority. Uh, no institution in Turkey can have uh, a legal uh, entity status if it is, uh, if it aims at having this uh, legal entity status for religious purposes. So th this is an obstacle vis-a-vis uh, -vis the enhancement of religious freedom uh, in Turkey, and it is a legal obstacle. And uh, in addition to this constitutional status, there's an art another article, Article 89 of the Political Parties Act uh, in Turkey, and that article protects the constitutional status of the ANET against uh, political parties or political organizations' aims that might result in the abolishment of this constitutional status of this very important organization. So any political party which aims at abolishing the status of or changing the status of uh, the ANET in the constitution uh, is regarded as an organization against the secular foundations of the republic, so it's a threat of closure, party closure. And the, such a decision was made by the Turkish Constitutional Court uh, for Özdep, uh, Özgürlük ve Demokrasi Partisi, Freedom and Democracy Party, back in 1994. So unless these elements in the constitution, uh, unless we don't change these elements in the constitution, then it is very difficult for us to uh, proceed in the direction of uh, enhancing uh, freedom of religion. But, but, uh, and I don't know if I have time, George, but uh, two, three, 
five. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we also have uh, the international dimension of uh, protect, protecting uh, religious freedom. So Turkey is a member of an international community, not only the Council of Europe, which is barely mentioned in these uh, debates. Uh, we were all speaking about Turkey's uh, goal to become a full member of the European Union, which is uh, slowly but still uh, going ongoing process. But Turkey has been a member of the Council of Europe since uh, its inauguration in 1949, I think. And it is one of the first uh, signatories to the European Convention of Human Rights, and it is bound by the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, Turkey is not on its own. It's not trying to become a member of the European world. Uh, uh, with all due respect, uh, I don't agree with Professor Ortaylı that we shouldn't change our mentality. We should change our mentality as members of Turkish society, especially the rulers, that we should accommodate to the uh, principles and pro uh, normative uh, standards of the European uh, Convention of uh, Human Rights. So th this is something that we have to change. Uh, unless we don't change this uh, frame of references that we th the way we think about the relations between uh, society and the state etc uh, there's no way to go any further in the direction of uh, religious freedom uh, i recommend some of the uh, members of this uh, audience uh, also that the present government's uh, some favorable actions and uh, transactions regarding freedom of religion, especially uh, recent uh, improvements in some non-Muslim minority groups' conditions, shall not be misleading because they have this old mentality of the Zimmi st status of non-Muslim groups and the Islamic notion of millet uh, exists within the conservative circle. So they, they approach not from the Kemalist Turkish nationalist view, but they approach from the Islamic notion of millet, and there's room for some degree of religious freedom, which is more favorable than the uh, Kemalist one, but they still regard, they, in the back of their minds, uh, I mean, they have this uh, well-entrenched ideology of uh, non-Muslims as Zimmi groups, whose some of their rights might be violated by the uh, Kemalist regime. So we have to take uh, a human rights perspective on uh, issues pertaining to religious freedom, and we have to adapt ourselves to the framework of international protection of religious freedom, uh, as it is done within the framework of the European Court in Strasbourg. Uh, some final remarks on uh, this international framework. I have some uh, rather, I don't know, strange uh, ideas about the place of Lausanne, for example. Uh, when you read Lausanne Part 3, Articles 37 to 45, you see almost all core elements uh, or core components of uh, human freedom of religion uh, are there. So uh, if we take the Part 3 of Lausanne, the articles uh, regarding pertaining uh, to uh, protection of minorities, then we may say that we don't need a constitution uh, in a way because uh, freedom of religion, especially for non-Muslim minorities, are under the good protection of Lausanne. And what is the status of Lausanne? Uh, I had this uh, wording of the Article 37, but uh, never mind. Uh, Article 37 says, Turkey undertakes to make, uh, to, to accept that our, uh, the provisions in uh, Articles 38 to 44 are fundamental laws. Now, this is 24 July 1923 before Turkey proclaimed republic. So no law, no regulation, no 
action, no state action, can violate these norms. Plus, they cannot be superior to these norms, prevail over them. I think that was the word. No action, no law, no regulation can prevail over 38, 39, 38 to 44 articles uh, in Lausanne. So uh, viewed from this perspective, uh, Lausanne has a supra-constitutional status. So uh, there is a dispute that whether this part three can be regarded as a human rights agreement that fall into the scope of the last clause of Article 90 as amended in 2004 in the Turkish Constitution, which states that human rights agreements duly put into effect uh, if there's a uh, contradiction between statute law and human rights agreements, then human rights agreements should prevail or should be taken as the standard. Uh, but Lausanne is not a human rights agreement, is it? Well, Lausanne is not a human rights agreement. What about part three? Part three, uh, those rights uh, on protection of minorities, that pertains to human rights. Now, in the uh, League of Nations system, we don't have this talk of, we don't have this language of human rights. It is, as Tori Lindholm uh, states in uh, this uh, seminal work uh, edited by uh, Cole Durham and others, uh, Called, uh, Tori Lindholm says there are three uh, stages in the development of uh, religious freedom in history. Cius regio, cius religio, or cius religio, cius regio. This is the first stage. Then protection of minorities stage. Then international protection of minority uh, human rights stage. Now we are in the third stage. But Lausanne was a product of the second stage, protection of minorities. Can we reinterpret Lausanne in a way to fit at least this part three to the international protection of human rights model? I think yes, because Vienna Convention on the uh, Vienna Law Convention on the Law of Treaties, uh, Article 60, Paragraph 5, uh, provides us with a uh, exception uh, to uh, the interpretation of Lausanne, because this part is part three, it is uh, human rights law. So uh, an adequate uh, interpretation of Lausanne uh, should solve the problems of uh, religious minorities. Uh, I'm not talking about this preposterous uh, issue of uh, on this ecumenical uh, adjective of the patriarchate. That's uh, very absurd. I mean, there's no way to, no need to discuss that. And, uh, Keeping Halki uh, closed is also uh, a grave violation of a human right, and we should either uh, go to <laughs> the international uh, legal uh, institutions, or better, uh, we should go to the European Court and uh, force the Committee of Ministers to uh, sanction, nice, to use uh, or to establish some yeah. sanctions on Turkey because. Uh, for the last decades, uh, Turkey has been violating European Convention and uh, the European uh, I mean, Committee of Ministers uh, are not doing much about it. Uh, thank you.